Okay, we'll talk about tracheal malacia here. This is one of our major airway malformations or obstructions. Um, these can be, this can be congenital or acquired, uh, any of these. Um, so tracheal malacia affects obviously the trachea, particularly the distal one-third of the trachea. So we'll just uh, refresh some anatomy. Uh, we'll do a quick overview of what this is, who it affects, why, clinical presentation, and then work up and management. So here is a left oblique view of your uh, pharynx and uh, with the esophagus dissected, obviously, and then uh, your larynx and roughly the upper part of the trachea, upper one third of the trachea or so. Okay, so looking anteriorly, uh, you have your hyoid bone. This is a good uh, landmark for children. Uh, in adults, you can use uh, the thyroid prominence or laryngeal prominence right here. This is also known as the Adam's apple and that will help you sort of locate where you're at. Um, and this is going to be really important actually when you are uh, when you're doing a tracheostomy. Uh, you'll be able to palpate the Adam's apple and you'll be able to palpate roughly where the cricoid cartilage is and there's a little little depression right in between there and that's your cricothyroid ligament and that's where you will uh, insert your trach tube. Okay, so now here we have ribs dissected, lots of structures dissected here. This is just sort of showing you uh, how long the trachea is. It really is a long structure before it bifurcates into the right and left main stem bronchi. Uh, tracheal malacia tends to affect lower one third of the trachea, and that is going to be all intrathoracic. So you have a, an extrathoracic trachea, which is in your neck and then an intrathoracic trachea, which is in your chest. And so tracheal malacia can affect anywhere in the trachea, uh, but it tends to affect the lower one third. Tracheal malacia is an abnormal collapse of the tracheal airway walls, most commonly affecting the distal one third of the trachea. Uh, it can affect more distal airways, in which case we would call it bronchomalacia, or if the two are present together, we can call it tracheobronchomalacia. It may be an isolated lesion, in which case it's primary, or it can be in combination with other lesions that cause either airway compression, which is going to result in collapse of the walls, uh, or damage to the actual airway itself, which uh, damages the integrity of the trachea and therefore uh, leads to collapse. So examples of compression can be things like mediastinal masses, vascular slums and rings, uh, and then uh, other things that can cause airway damage can be chronic inflammation, chronic lung disease, reflux disease, uh, typically tracheoesophageal fistula repair, since we repair this very early on, and bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is uh, something that tends to affect uh, preterm infants. Now, if you read the literature, you'll see that they like to split this up into types, but these types really just correspond to the cause. So type one tracheomalacia is just another way of saying primary tracheomalacia. And this is a developmental defect in the actual cartilage of the trachea. And this will improve and resolve as the airway enlarges with growth. Typically you don't have to do anything for this. Type two is a secondary tracheomalacia due to an extrinsic compression, so due to a mass or a vascular ring. And then type three is a secondary tracheomalacia due to intra-airway irritation or inflammation. So these are just the causes. Um, they can be called primary or secondary, or they can be called type one, type two, and type three. The presentation of tracheomalacia is wheezing. And it typically presents at four to eight weeks of age, generally in primary cases. In secondary cases, it will typically present when whatever uh, when the insult has uh, set in. Uh, so as far as, uh, you know, as, as far as what you should know, typically it presents at four to eight weeks of age when we're dealing with primary tracheomalacia, which uh, I do believe is the most common uh, form of tracheomalacia. But obviously if something else happens, uh, like you develop a mediastinal mass, then it can present a lot later. So it will worsen with activity in upper respiratory tract infections, and that's just because uh, upper respiratory tract infections will narrow the airway even more, and uh, so that's going to uh, increase the resistance. Tracheomalacia babies tend to be what are, what's known as happy wheezers, and so what this means is that they'll be wheezing, but 
Otherwise, they appear fine, they're happy, they're normal, they're saturating fine. And this stands in contrast to asthma, where you'll notice significant respiratory distress, or cystic fibrosis, where they can desaturate very easily. So remember that tracheomalacia is a happy wheezer. It's a baby with really no other problems other than that they're wheezing. You should consider history for any surgery, uh, particularly tracheoesophageal fistula repair, in which tracheomalacia is a common complication, reflux or aspiration, remember that GERD can cause tracheomalacia, and then feeding problems and most certainly intubation history. Um, because when a tube is placed, if it irritates the trachea, uh, it can cause uh, inflammation as well. On physical exam, you will hear uniform wheezing in all lung fields. Uh, however, if you have a bronchomalacia, then you may hear it more on one side than the other. The voice and cry will be normal uh, unless reflux was present, but that would be a symptom of reflux rather than of the trachea itself. The baby should otherwise appear healthy and normal. If the baby is in respiratory distress, it might not be tracheomalacia, you might be dealing with something like asthma or something else, uh, particularly because asthma presents with wheezing. Uh, saturation and the respiratory rate should be roughly normal. Now you can hear adventitious lung sounds if there is a concomitant laryngomalacia, and laryngomalacia uh, a lot of times can present with tracheomalacia as well. So if you do hear adventitious lung sounds, such as inspiratory stridor, which worsens also with activity in upper respiratory tract infections, uh, then you should think about the possibility of there being a laryngomalacia in addition to the tracheomalacia. You're not going to get a question in the USMLE that combines the two. That would be, that would be beyond the scope of the test. So your differential, bronchiolitis is a big one because it's so common. So typically though with bronchiolitis, even though there's wheezing, um, there also tends to be other adventitious lung sounds such as crackles, you can have a prolonged expiratory phase. Uh, notably a fever is typically present in bronchiolitis, 101, 102. You won't see that in tracheomalacia because this is uh, typically something that you're either born with or comes from uh, GERD or a surgical complication. Also, bronchiolitis tends to happen in the winter months. If you get an x-ray, you should see uh, patchy atelectasis. Asthma, uh, the saturation is more likely to be adversely affected. It also is episodic, whereas tracheomalacia will be ongoing. Uh, asthma will also resolve with bronchodilators. Cystic fibrosis, again here the saturation is more likely to be affected. You can definitively diagnose this with a sweat chloride test. In some cases, you hear wheezing in a baby that's afebrile, you may be concerned about cystic fibrosis. And so a sweat chloride test, really there's no contraindication to it. It's a very easy test, it's non-invasive, there's no complications. And so there's really never any contraindication to get a sweat chloride test, just to make sure. Uh, however, uh, Testing for cystic fibrosis is done uniformly in all babies uh, as part of the neonatal screening test. Foreign body obstruction tends to have a very unique history. It's sudden strider. Uh, so this you can differentiate based on history. Uh, radiographs can be obtained if you're still concerned. Uh, but this is sudden. It's not something, obviously, that you're born with. Uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or GERD, may be concomitant with tracheomalacia. It can be the cause. So uh, you should rule it out with a dual probe pH uh, probe, dual probe pH testing. Vascular lesions can also be concomitant with tracheomalacia, it can be the cause, and so that should also be ruled out with CT. So for diagnosis, you tend to suspect this clinically based on the fact that there's uniform wheezing, the baby is otherwise fine. Uh, it can be supported with, uh, with fluoroscopy or radiography. If you do an x-ray, you should see a tracheal air shadow, uh, or the, which is the lumen, uh, which will bow or narrow with expiration. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. So remember that I said that it tends to affect the distal one-third of the trachea. If it affects the distal one-third of the trachea, then your, your trachea is going to narrow with expiration. If it affects the uh, the the extrathoracic trachea, so the trachea in your neck, then it's going to be the opposite. So if it's extrathoracic, then it will collapse during inspiration. But the majority of lesions are intrathoracic, so they will collapse with expiration.
and that's why you're getting the wheezing because wheezing is ex is expiratory. Uh, a CT exam should be performed once you suspect tracheomalacia. This is a really good way to uh, to find vascular lesions and also really will help you confirm your diagnosis of tracheomalacia. However, the most accurate test is bronchoscopy. The ENT will typically want this done. You'll see AP narrowing and a loss of the semicircular shape of the lumen, as well as if it's extra thoracic, you'll note collapse on inspiration. So here's an example. Uh, so you have two x-rays that were taken uh, during the inspiratory phase, and then during the expiratory phase, you can see that there's a collapse of the air, sh uh, the air shadow. So you can see air shadow up here, air shadow down here, but collapsed right here. So this is a segmental tracheomalacia here. Again, here on CT, you have an expiratory phase, an inspiratory phase, and an expiratory phase. Here is inspiration, everything looks fine, then expiration, you see a collapse of the trachea. So here's a bronchoscopic view. Uh, here's during inhalation, you can see right here, you're at the, uh, at the carina. And then uh, during expiration, there's a near total collapse. The management is going to be to refer all of these children off to a pediatric ENT. You'll manage any potential causative factors if they're present. You want to certainly investigate for those, especially if there's a history that seems suspicious. Uh, systemic corticosteroids can be used for exacerbation. So what do we mean by exacerbations? Let's say the child has tracheomalacia and they get a respiratory tract infection. Uh, you can give them corticosteroids provided that you rule out things like pneumonia where corticosteroids would make it worse. Uh, but uh, ultimately, in addition to any antibiotic you give them if you need to, you can, should give them corticosteroids as well. That will help reduce the inflammation uh, and uh, reduce any uh, risk of respiratory distress. So systemic corticosteroids can be given for exacerbations. You will not give this long-term though. Avoid bronchodilators. They tend to make tracheomalacia worse. Regular follow-up, looking for failure to thrive, uh, monitoring their growth, symptoms uh, that should start to get better roughly by about uh, two to three years of age. Surgical correction can be done. Uh, usually this is reserved for complicated cases, so the child has failure to thrive, there's a recurrent pneumonia, or there's compressive or vascular lesions which can be fixed. Uh, prognosis is excellent. The primary condition will tend to resolve by age three. In secondary cases, particularly tracheoesophageal fistula repair, it may take a little bit longer.